If you wanna buy a house, a great place to start your search is Zillow. And if you wanna buy a really bizarre house, a great place to start your search is Zillow Gone Wild. It's an Instagram account with nearly 2 million followers that highlights some of our housing market's more peculiar properties. Like this $1.1 million Colorado home with a seemingly normal exterior, average looking living room, and then your typical over-the-top Disney-themed wing with a Mickey Mouse head-shaped hole cut through the wall to reveal Mickey on a chair, Mickey on the bathroom rug, Mickey on the guest towels, and then walls of memorabilia, a bed fit for a princess, and this statue of Goofy sticking out his Or how about this little egg in Rochester, New York? It's a lovely four bedroom, three bathroom, 2000 plus square foot, one rabbit home. Who's ready to greet you in the living room, the kitchen, the den, the bedroom, and the bathtub. And then there's this Las Vegas bachelor pad, decked out in original graffiti and art of hideous animated creatures, what could be Elvis Presley, and these authentic bathroom wall scrawlings to make your cozy home feel like a filthy dive. The kitchen even appears to have several pieces of work that resemble the figures from the Bored Ape Yacht Club. Hopefully those Bored Apes don't make up the bulk of the abode's $850,000 value. Over a hundred of those NFTs sold for nearly $25 million back in 2021, but these days, they're selling for around 43 grand a piece or about a tenth of some of those 2022 board Ape values. All of which are still shocking sums for what amounts to JPEGs of a computer-generated blind monkey in a fez. No wonder that the investors in these board Apes are currently suing the Sotheby's Auction House, the digital asset company that made these works of what they consider to be art, as well as some celebrities that promoted these things, like Paris Hilton and Justin Bieber, for misleadingly promoting NFTs to the public and inflating their value. But if you're still dead set on investing your hard-earned money into something with inflated numbers, it might actually make sense to drop 800 grand into a home infested with apes who have little going on, because that home actually offers something tangible, a home. People don't just buy houses as a costly way to store their keys. As mortgage backer Freddie Mac points out, a home is a great way to build equity, stabilize monthly payments, reap tax benefits, and do whatever you want to the place without the landlord swinging by unannounced to ask how often you're flushing the toilet. Unfortunately, not everyone has tens or hundreds of thousands of down payment dollars burning a hole in their pockets, especially since that would require massive pairs of pants that not even the J. Crew fall collection could accommodate. Right now, Americans are living through the most unaffordable housing market since 1984, the year the Macintosh was introduced, the Soviets boycotted the Olympics, and Charles in Charge was on the air. For the week ending September 7th, the average for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage was 7.18%, slightly down from a 22-year high of 7.23% in August. But still, it's the fourth consecutive week that mortgage rates have been above 7%. Last year, the 30-year fixed rate was 5.89%. Hey, are you still there? I've been talking about interest and mortgages and percentages, and you can watch literally anything else more exciting on your TV or phone or YouTube. How about some fun stock footage to help cleanse the palate? Sorry, we gotta get back to this home price thing. So last week, the Mortgage Bankers Association said applications to buy a home have hit a 27 year low. And experts say it's a trifecta of high mortgage rates, stubbornly high home prices, and low inventory that's keeping you from buying that Roadrunner mailbox you've had your eye on. Inflation also appears to be playing a role here. The government has been raising interest rates to get inflation closer to its 2% target, the annual rate was at 3.3% as of July, and until the economy cools off a bit, people will have less spending power for those Roadrunner mailboxes. But you know in Monopoly how when you run out of houses, you can't buy any more until somebody builds a hotel and makes their old houses available for purchase again? In an almost disrespectively reductive way, it's a little like that. Freddie Mac estimates that between 2018 and 2020, the national housing supply shortage increased from 2.5 to 3.8 million units short. And a combination of declining construction of starter homes, more millennials entering the buying market, and pandemic-related factors are all contributing to a shortage of available homes that isn't expected to subside until at least 2030. Axios points out there's also a lack of available labor, zoning regulations, NIMBYs who don't want new stuff being built near them. So yeah, go ahead and paint your apartment because you might be there for a while. The pandemic factor is of interest here. Throughout most of the 2010s, the average mortgage rate was less than 5%, 
with a low end average of 2.96% in 2021, peak virus. In April, a survey from Realtor.com of people who want to sell their home found that 82% of them feel locked in by these 2 or 3% mortgage rates. CNBC called this the golden handcuff effect in which people who want to move don't because they don't want to get blasted by double or even triple rates. There's this too. Back in April, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics monthly labor review pointed to an economic letter by the Federal Reserve Board of San Francisco. Sorry, do you need that stock footage again? Okay, basically, the government cited research that found remote work was part of the increase for housing prices across the board. That's for buyers and renters too. And people who borrow bedrooms, basements, and bathrooms on a monthly basis don't have it so hot either. The National Low Income Housing Coalition says the national shortage of available rental housing for low income Americans is 7.3 million rental units short, with only 33 available homes for every 100 extremely low income renter households. If this makes you wanna just give it all up and move into an open field in the Catskills, sorry, those cost like 75 grand too. While there aren't a lot of easy and immediate solutions to make housing more available and affordable, here in New York, housing that's available and affordable is about as common as a bag of trash in a shiny blue bin instead of piled up on the sidewalk. The city here is considering all sorts of things to up the stock of affordable housing, like renting out windowless bedrooms, since as the mayor advocates, you don't need no window where you're sleeping, it should be dark. But the city that never sleeps, because I guess its rooms have windows, just took an interesting step towards making long-term rental units available, making short-term rental units unavailable. The city of New York is in an affordable housing crisis that we could only resolve by building new housing, but also by keeping the housing that we currently have, preserving it. And if we begin to start converting our current apartments into what we could basically call into hotels, we're never gonna resolve the affordable housing crisis. So we need to make sure that we're preserving our affordable housing, uh, which is for people to live in permanent housing, not for short-term rentals. That's a New York City council member discussing new rules that impacts hosts of short-term rentals through companies like Airbnb and Verbo. And yes, Verbo is correct, I looked it up. From its founding in 1995, it originally stood for vacation rentals by owner. But everyone just called it Verbo, and in 2019 they said, fine, it's Verbo. So yes, it's called Verbo, but you might not be calling Verbo home in New York City. Because Verbo, Airbnb, and other short-term rental hosts now officially have to go through a registration process through the city to put up a unit for a short-term stay. If, say, you want to rent out your guest room, you've also now got to be physically present during the duration of the entire rental. Hope you know what time you want to take a shower. And on top of that, more than two guests won't be allowed to stay over at one time, effectively barring large families. Airbnb fought this in court, claiming these rules were effectively a ban, but the new regulations nevertheless kicked in last Tuesday. Opponents of these rules say some smaller rental homes are being lumped in with large apartment buildings. But supporters of the measure and this NYC City Council member believe these changes are necessary to prevent apartments from becoming full-time hotels with strangers in hallways. God forbid the landlord ever gets around to fixing the ice machine. Imagine if there's a, an apartment in a building um, that's current, consistently being rented for, for late night partying during the weekends. That means that uh, the rest of the neighborhood, the rest of the neighbors in the building will not be able to get a, a restful night. Uh, so that's a problem that uh, we cannot allow to uh, become a reality in the state of New York. Airbnb's global policy director said the rule changes were a blow to the thousands of New Yorkers and small businesses who rely on home sharing, and the city is sending a clear message to millions of potential visitors that you are not welcome. It's worth pointing out that a working paper from a researcher at the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard found that Airbnb rentals did have a negative impact on renters in New York City, causing rent increases of around 125 bucks a year on average, but ultimately concluded that banning or restricting Airbnb rentals in New York wouldn't have a major effect on affordability. That New York City Council member says permanent housing in the city is still a worthy goal. If there's a brown store with, with a one bedroom apartment, that could be a one bedroom apartment uh, that's permanent housing for a family that needs it. They could obviously earn f uh, income through uh, the rental of that apartment, but the only difference is that it's gonna be a permanent, uh, it's gonna be permanent housing rather than a short term rental. Speaking of permanent housing, Redfin says the median sale price of a home in New York City in July 
was four fifths of a million dollars. But can you really put a price on 500 square feet of living space? Yes, $1,690 per square foot. 